Another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cindy and Vicki here with Prose talking about books we love with fabulous authors and sipping cocktails. Now, uh, it's very early where our next guest is. So I've got coffee. Cindy, what are you drinking? Well, I brought a, a Bloody Mary uh, to to the show today. And um, I'd like to give a, a special cheers to my friend Jack down in Marco Island, who is the one that always has a, a, a Bloody Mary with me. So we're overdue, my friend. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. And where were you yesterday when Facebook went down and Instagram went down and what's up went down. My heart was going pitter patter and going, where is all of the stimulus that I need? <laughs> was that uh, in the office? Of course. But really, I, uh, you know, um, I actually use WhatsApp quite a bit for some clients that are international. And um, so I was like, well, sorry, I can't, can't message you now. But the funny part was, I texted my daughter and I usually use WhatsApp and I set off an alarm in her classroom. So <laughs> Oh no, I bet she loved that. Love you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems kind of sketchy to me, especially with the 60 minutes piece. Did you see that with the whistleblower? Everybody's talking about that, about Facebook and everything that's going down for them to all go down and go dark for a while. I'm thinking conspiracy conspiracy theories are going to be running rampant, don't you think? You know, it, it just it does not seem plausible that a global shutdown, you know, like global dark period for that long. So get your conspiracies together. <laughs> But we are so excited today. Thankfully, Facebook is back today. The Tattooist of Auschwitz is one of the best-selling books of the 21st century. And together, The Tattooist and Silka's Journey have sold over 8 million copies. Her latest novel, Three Sisters, is out today. And we are so excited to welcome live from Australia, Heather Morris. Hello. Hello. For me, it's water, folks, okay? How, what's the time there? What's the time difference? Like 10, 12 hours? Uh, 6.30 a.m. Oh, thank you so much for getting up early and doing this. And you're in quarantine, right? Yes, I am. Hence the backdrop not being very exciting. Sorry, folks, but um, it's either the curtains pulled because of or my unmade bed. I guess this probably isn't what you expected for the big reveal of three sisters today would be stuck in a hotel room in quarantine. No, it didn't, because I didn't have any say about um, when I came here. I've relocated interstate in Australia, but I was just rung by the Queensland police and told, this is the date you have to be uh, in the, the state to go into quarantine. So I had no say in it. Oh, my. Are you by yourself or is your husband with you? Now I'm by myself at the moment and we'll be for another week, one week to go. Oh, gotcha. Hopefully really good room service. No. No? <laughs> they, drop, they drop a brown paper bag outside my door twice a day and just knock on the door. You have to wait a minute, put a mask on, reach out and bring it in. But my son and daughter-in-law who live up here, they, they've managed to get me in um, care baskets. So I have some of the finest wines and cheeses and fruits. So I'm doing okay. Oh, good for you. Good You've taught them well. <laughs> now, before we get to the new book, we want to talk about your journey, how you became a writer. And um, I was telling Cindy that um, at first you had plans on being a screenwriter, right? Yeah. How naive was that? <clears throat> It was a classic case of getting to that point in my life when my children stopped asking me to drive them somewhere. It was more, hey, mum, can I have your car keys? And so I found I had time on my side, like I think all women do once your children no longer need them, so they think. And I went looking for something for me. I'm not normally selfish, and I thought, what would I like? And I wanted, I love movies, so I thought 
I'm going to learn how to write a screenplay. So I started going to workshops, online uh, seminars, and uh, following my time learning that while still working full time. What's your favorite movie? Witness. Witness, the one with um, um, Harrison. Harrison Ford? Harrison Ford. Kelly, Kelly McGillis. Okay. I'm wow. a bit there because I actually know the screenwriter. She's a good friend of mine and okay. an Academy Award for it. <laughs> and is it true that the tattooist was kind of commissioned to be a movie and you or someone wanted Ryan Gosling and Natalie Portman in the leads? Yes, a production company here in Melbourne, they optioned it from me and we're trying to make it as, as a feature film and I've worked with producers and directors and developing the script. And the person who wanted Brian Gosling was in fact Lolly himself. After I had told him he couldn't have Brad Pitt, he considered Brad Pitt was the best looking guy around and so was he. But uh, we, we started going to movies, he, he and I, he had to find the perfect person to play him. And he was hilarious sitting in movie <laughs> theaters yelling out at me, what were you thinking? He doesn't look anything like me. And I'm going, you're 88, he's 25. He's never going to look like you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he saw the movie The Notebook and he went, that's me. He should be me. And everybody in the theatre heard about it. <laughs> well, tell everybody how you met Lolly. Ah, don't you love coincidences? Well, maybe they're not. I had a cup of coffee with a friend who I actually hadn't seen for several months. I'd been um, just not wanting to go in on weekends. I lived out of the city. During that coffee, she just casually said to me, Oh, by the way, I have a friend whose mother's just died. His father has asked him to find somebody he can tell a story to. That person can't be Jewish. You're not Jewish. Do you want to meet him? I asked her, what's the story? And she said, I don't know. And I said, never mind, I'll meet him. And a week later, I knocked on the apartment door of Lali Sokolov and into his life and he into mine. Unbelievable. And it took a total of, what, about 10 years before... The book came to fruition. Well, yeah, look, I hung on to it as a screenplay. What an idiot. Yeah, sometimes I think I was an idiot for not doing anything with it other than trying to get people in your country to um, read this thing and uh, maybe show some interest in what I thought was a pretty darn good story. Uh, it took a visit to California to my brother and sister-in-law in San Diego, and my sister-in-law kind of looked at me. I think she was tired of hearing about me talk about damn Hollywood, and <laughs> leaned across the table and said, oh, for goodness sake, write the thing as a book and get on with it. Oh, it was kind of a light bulb moment. Me, write a book? Oh, okay, well, I'll give it a go. It really was as simple as that. I had no idea how to write a book. Really? Hmm. That's, that's one of the life's little nudges we were just talking about last week. Here, go in this direction. So, Yes. So you had to show me. From I was just so lucky in some ways that the publishers I got who told me, well, this is a memoir, you know, go away and write the memoir, honey. And I went, okay. So I went to memoir school for a day. It was a five day course because I knew after one day I couldn't tell Lolly's story that way. So, all right. And then it's historical fiction. If you want, that's what you want to write, you have to write it now as um, you know, in the third person. I tried that and it just wasn't working for me. And in the end, they kind of gave up and they said, well, why don't you just write the story the way you want it written and we'll see how you go. Hence, I sat down up in my brother and sister-in-law's cabin up on Big Bear Mountain in the middle of winter for a month, just me and two squirrels, and had my beautifully adapted or structured screenplay, and I adapted that into the novel, just using Lully's voice, Lully's words, which is why I'm told it's a simple read, isn't it? And I go, mm-hmm. <laughs> what happens? Did Lolly ever get the chance to read the finished product? Not the novel. Um, he died before that, but he read many, many drafts of the screenplay. He was involved in, in trying to get that produced. So did you have any, I mean, was he more of, no, don't do it this way, or, or how did that process work? He was on my shoulder the whole time I was writing it. And after, if I wasn't yelling at him, I was yelling at those squirrels. Because, <laughs> yes, I'm going to remember, I spent three amazing years with this gentleman. And his voice was in my head. 
he, because of his Eastern European background, had turns of phrases and, and he has simple language because English was his second language. It was very clear in my head, write it this way, keep it simple. That's not what I said. I would never say that. <laughs> no, wasn't I? I put it down to the squirrels, really. Was he still in your head when you wrote Three Sisters? Oh, always. He's always in my always. head. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that, this, this new novel that's out today. Yes, it is. And thank you. Thank you. And once again, Three Sisters came to me in the most amazing way. I was uh, on a book tour in South Africa and I was staying in a little wine region just out of Cape Town and came back from a day or a night in the wineries and read an email about one or two o'clock in the morning from a man who lives in Toronto, Canada. And he wrote to me saying, I picked up a copy of The Tattooist of Auschwitz to take it to read on the plane, going to visit my mother in Israel. Now, Canada has the same cover as Australia. It's not the same cover that you have of Tattooist in the US. It is a black cover with just two arms coming down from the elbow and the tattooed numbers on each arm of Lully and Gita. Now, this man got to his mum's house in Tel Aviv and left the book on her coffee table the next day. She walked past, looked down at it, and said to him, that must be about Lully and Gita. When he looked at her and said, how do you know that? She said, but look at the number on the girl on the arm. Now, look at mine. There are three apart. Gita was two in front of me. She was only one in front of Sibby, which is her sister. And from that, he wrote and told me how his mom and his um, aunts had grown up with Gita, went to school with Gita, went on the train with Gita, uh, going to Auschwitz. <clears throat> Gita had visited them in Israel. So from the same email, I wrote back, and a couple of days later, I got a, an email saying that his mom wanted to talk to me. But could she phone me? So she phoned me in, in Cape Town, I think I was. And this beautiful 93-year-old woman started telling me about Lali and Gita. She said, can I see you? I'd rather talk to you in person and tell you about them. Just something in her style and her voice. I knew I had to visit her. I had to see her. I contacted my publishers in London and said, about this woman. And they said, well, do you want to go? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going back to Australia in two days' time. How about we don't do that? Instead, you go straight to, to uh, Jerusalem, to Israel. I remember saying to her, but Kate, I can't go in two days' time. She said, well, why not? You know, there's nothing on back in Australia you need to rush back for. I said, no, I know, but I've run out of clean knickers. I was <laughs> <laughs> she promptly told me to go out and buy some more. And 24 hours later, I walked off a plane in Tel Aviv and into the apartment and into the lives of the Meller sisters and their families. But that's how I got the story. Wow. So how many years did you spend with them? Well, that was um, just on two years ago that that happened. And uh, so since then, I put out another book which has not been released in the US until the middle of the year. So there has been another non-fiction book written by me that's out in Australia and the UK called Stories of Hope. So I had to do that. Uh, there was some publicity around Silka because that had just been released. So I really only got onto it, oh gosh, yeah, about a year ago. It was Christmas last year and I sat down to start writing it. amazing story it's almost like it was meant to be well i did get back to israel again in january last year just before the world closed down and lots and lots of messages with the families um all the families i'm just so delighted and when you read get the book for any of you out there that do want to read it please don't just close it when you get to the end because following on from there are some beautiful letters from members of the family, including 95-year-old Livy, um, granddaughter, sons of Sibby and Livy. They wanted to write, and we included them in the book, how they feel about my telling the story and about these amazing three sisters. Wow. 
I've got chills. <laughs> so Cindy's really into audiobooks. So who, uh, and I don't know who does any of your audiobooks. I've been very, very lucky with the tattooist I asked for, and I got Richard Armitage, this amazing actor, not only very easy on the eye, but with a beautiful, beautiful voice. And uh, so stunning the job that he do that, in fact, for that year, I think it was 2018, he won the Audi, which is the Audio Book Awards, equivalent of the Oscars, for the best wow. uh, audio book, fiction audio book in, the, in New York that year. Uh, for The Silker's Journey, Louise uh, Dreary, which, Dreary, which is an, she's an actress in London. I'm not sure if you had the miniseries mm -hmm. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes out there with Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, she is the, the lead actress in that. So oh, that's okay. And with three sisters, we have what is a lady called Finty, who is audiobook royalty in the UK. Uh, her mom is a beautiful, stunning actress named Judy Dench. So wow. James Bond fans, she's M. And for M, yes. Movie ever made and miniseries, she is just the most delightful actress, and I'm so so chuffed. So, do you meet all these people? Do you say I don't? I mean, do you give them any instruction on how to to read the written page? Or oh, gosh, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, <laughs> they are masters of their craft. Heaven forbid I should even attempt to tell them how to do their job. Well, I was going to tell you, I think your voice, I think you're a wonderful storyteller. I could just listen to your inflection, the way you speak. I was thinking you should read it, but I mean, I guess you got some, you get some pretty big names out there doing the, yeah, the I job. Have, I, got the talent. I have the talent. I'm sticking with it. I, I love your voice as well. So I'll second that <laughs> nomination that you should, the next book you need to read as well. So that's very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> So if this is the trilogy and it's over, what is next for you? I've asked if I can have six months off writing. That doesn't mean to say um, my publishers and I haven't come to a, a decision about what I'm writing, but we're just keeping it under wraps. I haven't been able to really enjoy these the books that I've written in terms of not having to be focusing on other projects. I've, I've written four books in under four years and the kind of pressure to not only get them written, but research, because my books all require research, including the three sisters, by the way. I did have researchers back in Slovakia who, who went and researched the family. Uh, but I said, look, it's still coming out and being translated in many countries. I'd like to be able to just, once Qantas flies again, come on Qantas, I want to be able to go now to those countries, all of which invite me, and actually spend some time now enjoying the books and talking up these three amazing girls. Are they still alive? Are they still all with us? Mm -hmm. Two of them are, Livy and Magda. They're in, um, 96 and 98. Wow. Um, that's so amazing. And don't you think that's what's so important about, I've, I've talked to some people that say, oh, is it another book about the Holocaust? I said, are you kidding me? I mean, once these people are gone, once these sisters, I mean, they're, the only thing we'll have left will be the stories. Well, yes, but this, is, this story is not just about the Holocaust. So maybe this is where it is a point of difference. Um, I do actually start by, in the beginning, talking about their life in, in Slovakia, because the whole purpose of their survival, the whole meaning behind their survival stems from a promise these young girls made to their father. And, and I'm quite happy to give away the, the beginning, the opening. They made a promise to their father that living the, the 96 year old now, she was only three at the time, but her older two sisters you know, kept reminding her to the point that she thinks she does remember making it, uh, that they would never be separated they would stay together, protect each other, look after each other. Now, the day after they made that promise, their father died. Mm. So the, their whole life has been about trying to keep this promise to their father. And of course, then there's the time in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, but only for two sisters for the majority of it, because they did get separated. 
So the story's written in, with two narratives flowing through, but I think you can follow it. Livy and Sibi in Auschwitz-Birkenau and Nagda are back in Slovakia, hiding in forests, being hidden in the, the ceilings of uh, sympathetic locals and her and her mother and grandfather surviving back in Slovakia until she got caught. And that she then got brought to Birkenau, not knowing her sisters were there, that these girls found each other amongst the 100,000 prisoners, all separated in their little blocks and, and areas is phenomenal. Their survival of their death march should be a book in itself. Incredible months of being taken from other camps to other camps with the SS to the point where they said, no, enough, and ran. Uh, and then started hiding out and traveling through villages in the countryside of Germany, trying to get to allies somewhere. One day the Germans are their threat, the next day it's the Russians. So this incredible, you know, several months of survival on what was the death march. But it doesn't end there. And this is where we take another leap outside of the Holocaust, actually. Getting back to Slovakia, they found that anti-Semitism was still rife and they weren't wanted back home. Their home, when they went there, was taken and over. And uh, yes, they had to you know, leave. So they decided that they would go to Israel. Where else could you go but to Palestine at that point? They saw that as their promised land. So they then arrived in Israel at that pivotal point in history when that nation state was being created. And there I will tell you what it was like, for the creation of that nation state through the eyes of young survivors, not just them, but the boys they met and married. And um, it's a different take from what it would be and what it is from the military and the United Nations and the people, the bureaucracy involved in creating it. These are three girls, three families, and the incredible families they then went on and had. Now, Lolly was very adamant about who he wanted to play him if there would be a movie. Are the three sisters the same way? <laughs> no, we haven't talked about that. You haven't? Um, no. um, I think we'll hold that conversation off. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, must, I must have it with Livy and, and Magda. Uh, well, they are still with us. So, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for you know, bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just girls, so Vicky and Cindy. Livy was 15 years old. Magda yeah. 17, Sibby 19. It's, it's amazing how resilient people can be when they come back, you know, go through such tragic tragic situation and then, and then go on to live such meaningful lives. So... Um, clearly, it was a story that was meant to be told, eh? Well, yes. And remember, I sent to, went to Tel Aviv because they wanted to talk to me about Lali and Gita. And I was hearing their story being wound up in it. And, and I was just being blown away and going, you have your own story, which is phenomenal. And at that point, I'd only heard bits of it. I actually suggested to them that they should find um, an author, a ghostwriter in Israel. You need to find somebody here that you can sit down with and tell your story. And that was after, I don't know, three or four days, maybe more with them. And it was quite funny because you and I, we live we live in countries that are yeah, massive on scale. And they said to me one, one afternoon as I was leaving to go back to my hotel room, they said, have you ever been to Jerusalem? And I said, no. And they said, do you want to go? And I went, oh, well, why don't you want to go now? And I went, well, it's too far away looked at me because there were several other family members there uh, and went well, what do you mean it's too far away it's 40 minutes down the road I went, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> talk about being put in your place <laughs> so the next day i did go to jerusalem and when i came back the following day i got met by um, a whole lot of family members and while i was in jerusalem all the siblings, the cousins, the adult grandchildren, and even the great grandchildren all got together and talked about how they wanted to ask me if I would write it. So that's what I came back to. Mm. Who's going to say no to that? How could you say no, right? Yeah. Had they had well, they read um, your book? Had had they read the the tattooist um, by the time you had arrived, or? 
Yes, here's the beautiful thing, Libby, uh, before she rang me and or even had her son write to me, when she saw the book, she took it off her son and she never slept for the next two days while she read it. And that's when I, I went to her home and after a few minutes, she picked up the book and she waved it at me and she said, everything you say in here is true. You have told their story and you have told mine. Well, I hadn't yet, Livy, but I have now. I just got chills. <laughs> if you were to just give one word or maybe two words to express what, what you're trying to convey in these books, would it be hope? Would it be survival, both? Look, it's both those words, um, and I'm just going to flog an extra couple here. It's also about sibling love. I mean, all too often we think of love stories in the romantic terms. True. That, that's not what it's all about, folks. Uh, to me, there is no thing that, in fact, compares to the unconditional love of family. Do you have a very tight family? I do, which is why I'm now in Brisbane because <laughs> some of my family moved up here. So the rest of my family in Melbourne, we're all coming up here to be here. Well, we are so thankful and lucky uh, to have you on the show with us today. We feel badly that not only you had to get up early in the morning, 6 a.m. right now, but that uh, you're in quarantine. Hopefully, you'll be doing a book tour when things calm down and you will be coming to the States, no doubt, I hope. Yes, absolutely. Hoping early next year. Early next year. And tell everybody where they can get the book. Anywhere, Amazon, I'm sure. I believe I am anywhere and everywhere. And to all the booksellers out there, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful to, to them. I love going into bookstores and you know just going in there to see what everyone's got and what's out. You are my favorite place to be. And of course, uh, the Amazons and the other book depositories and other online places. But um, yeah, it's there in lots and lots of large numbers, I'm told. Well, thanks. It's Three Sisters, Heather Morris. We love you. Can't wait to see who's going to play all the characters in all your fabulous books. Mm. And hope Thank to you. see you in the States. Good night. Good day. Good day. Thank you. Join us next week for another edition of Prose with Vicki Locke and Cindy Woolley from C2 Communications.